Today we're going to talk about harassment online and not just the fact that it happens, which I think we all know, but how that manifests and how the network looks for people who are doing the harassing online. So what I'm going to show you today, these are the results of a paper that I did, obviously with a lot of people. You can see the long list of authors here. Uh, these are all students who volunteered to work on this project. We published a paper, a large labeled corpus for online harassment research. And what that means is that we spent about nine months as a team finding harassing content online, analyzing it. Uh, it was a really difficult process because you have to read really terrible things and go searching for them. And so we actually had to have a protocol in place for how long you could look at stuff. And then when you had to take a break and like go look at pictures of puppies or anything to uplift you because it can be really damaging to be surrounded by really negative content like that all the time. So I want to talk about just how much of a problem this is and how prevalent it is. What we're looking at here is the profile picture for an account. Uh, this was called Tay. It was a bot account that Microsoft set up, so it was very explicitly a bot. And it was supposed to represent like a teenage girl, and she was going to learn from what people said online to be able to respond. So you could send her a message on Twitter, and then she would respond to you. So this account was up for a few hours, and then started tweeting stuff like this. Um, why did she start tweeting really anti-Semitic, hateful, white nationalist kind of stuff? Because people tweeted that at her. Um, people thought, oh, this is great. Here's this bot. We're going to teach her to say all this stuff that we want her to say. And so you could send a really calm, kind of meaningless message to her and she would respond with something like this. Uh, this kind of content is all over social media. It may not be something that you encounter yourself if you're just kind of looking at your normal feed because you're not choosing to follow these people. But if you dig into the comments or if you go to the feeds of people who are normally targeted by stuff like this, you'll see this kind of thing all the time. So what we were talking about in this work was not just casual kind of harassment like someone telling you that you look ugly in an outfit that you have on, but uh, really abusive kinds of stuff, violent threats, um, direct or indirect. Now these are prohibited by Twitter. You're not allowed to make threats of violence against people. Uh, and the way that you can combat that, of course, is that Twitter has a mechanism to report this. And I'm going to pick a little bit on Twitter in this talk, but it is definitely not them. Uh, they seem to have a real problem that they don't want to fix. Uh, they say they can't fix it, but there's a lot of things that they could do that they're just not doing. Um, so they're choosing not to fix this, but plenty of other platforms have similar problems. And so the issue is if someone makes a threat against you and then you report it according to uh, the Twitter guidelines that say that that's not allowed, you often will get a response like this. So here we have the reported tweet, I will rape you when I get the chance, and the response from Twitter, which I have had happen to threatening tweets that I've had, uh, we found that the reported account doesn't violate the Twitter rules. They just don't seem to look at it. And uh, if it's an account, whether it's a popular account or not, uh, they typically don't consider things like this uh, to be threats. Then if there's a public outcry about it, Twitter will usually go back and revisit it and apologize and say they made a mistake. Um, at the same time, people can post really benign things that are just not nice, uh, say, to legislators, and some of that will get taken down. So the Twitter reporting mechanism is really bad. Twitter is not interested in blocking this kind of content in any serious way. They let all sorts of it through. Um, and so that means there was a lot for us to find. And so what, what I want to talk about today is first, what's the full picture of online harassment? What kind of stuff is going on? Who is doing it? And why? So uh, I just want to highlight this one tweet as an example of why this is so hard. So if you're missing the context of what white genocide is, this seems like a pretty inflammatory, potentially violent tweet. All I want for Christmas is white genocide. Um, this is a professor who tweeted this. He got a whole bunch of backlash for it. Uh, so is this tweet okay or not? Um, and this comes from a context that not everyone has. So this term white genocide, this is something that's used by the alt-right community. Um, and they talk about white genocide. And that's a term that refers to immigration, interracial marriage, um, biracial or multiracial children. They call immigration and 
uh, mixed race marriages, white genocide, because it's destroying the purity of the white race and destroying uh, the white dominance of this country from their perspective. And so when this guy says, all I want for Christmas is white genocide, what he's saying is, all I want for Christmas is diversity, uh, acceptance of interracial marriage and acceptance of immigrants. And so then it doesn't seem so bad. And that's why this sort of thing is difficult. There are lots of calls for legitimate genocide on Twitter. Um, but this, you really need to understand exactly what that term means to go, oh, he's actually asking for something that we all kind of consider a social good if you're not a white nationalist using their own language. And so that made it really difficult to put together a data set um, especially because we had a lot of non-American students working on this project who weren't familiar with a lot of the cultural, uh, racial, political backgrounds of what we have in this country. So if you don't know, um, say, what the KKK is, which you might not know if you aren't from the U.S., then uh, tweets that are related to that or use that sort of language, it can be hard to decide uh, if they're good or bad. So I put that as background. Uh, so our data set filtered this out. We had a lot of long discussions, and so we built a data set of tens of thousands of legitimately harassing tweets. But in that process, we went through a lot of steps to figure out how do we get that data, right? How do you just go onto Twitter or any social media platform and just find bad stuff? Uh, maybe you look for particular search terms. We did end up doing that. And then uh, if you find a particularly offensive term, then you can go through the tweets that use that and filter out the ones that are actual harassment versus the ones that are talking about it. Another thing that we looked at that we ended up not using in the final study, but that led to its own interesting path of research was looking at Twitter block lists. So as you know, anyone can block someone on Twitter and they don't have to see what they say and you can block people for any reason. And it can be hard if you want to avoid being harassed, especially if you're part of a certain group, to find everyone that you want to block. And so there's a mechanism where you can share the list of people that you have blocked and you can subscribe to other people's block lists. And so on Twitter now, for example, I think I have 20,000 people blocked. I don't know who most of them are. They're blocked because I'm subscribing to the block lists of organizations who aggregate information about people who harass and post otherwise content that I don't want to see. And so they automatically get blocked for me. And so we said, oh, well, maybe those block lists will be useful for us to find people who are kind of widely blocked and then look at their content. And it ended up not being a great solution because most of those people, even if they're really active harassers, post a lot of stuff that's not harassment as well. And so uh, we'd find one tweet out of every 10 was harassing, but that's a lot of stuff to go through that is perfectly benign content. But still, we thought it was interesting to look at who are these people who are getting blocked. So we ended up looking at uh, a service called BlockBot. It was created by uh, originally on a forum of feminist atheists and has since expanded to that, where now it's widely used by a lot of people. Um, they were blocking people who were harassing them online. There are level one, two, and three trolls on their list. Level one would be the worst, people who are making really active threats of violence, um, saying really aggressive, violent things. Uh, a level two is sort of in the middle, people that they find are annoying. Uh, level three is people that you may or may not like, but you don't necessarily want to see what they have to say. Um, so the level one were the really the worst of the worst from their perspective. And so we downloaded the list of level one trolls from the BlockBot account. And we went onto Twitter and we collected their follower and following list so we could build a social network of what that looked like. So what's a network of harassers going to look like? We don't really know because they could just be individuals doing their own harassing because they're pissed off about something, not connected to anyone else. Or you may see a few little groups or maybe a group of three or four guys in one place and they're kind of all actively going after someone, but you have a bunch of little uh, little blips, or maybe it's one core group of people. We didn't really know what to expect. And what we ended up with was something that looks just like any traditional social network. Um, a lot of interconnection, really clearly defined, cl defined clusters, and crossover between them. And we then went in and said, all right, is there anything that's connecting these clusters? So maybe it's geographic. These are we're talking mostly about English speakers here, so maybe these are people from different regions of the U.S., these are people from the U.K. Um, are there topical connections that are bringing them together? 
And it turned out that there were mostly topical connections. Um, so the purple group that you see up at the top, these are Gamergate people. Uh, if you don't know about Gamergate, I actually had a class of students write sort of the definitive history of Gamergate. Uh, you can find their article if you want a lot of depth on that. But essentially this was a uh, internet harassment movement from a few years back where female journalists who wrote about video games were targeted. Um, they were threatened with all kinds of violence, uh, rape, murder, bomb threats were called in, their houses were doxxed. Um, a lot of them ended up having to go into hiding, cancel their public appearances. And it was because um, a group of pretty much entirely male, white, video gamers were upset that they were arguing that video games should be less sexist and more inclusive of women. Uh, they would certainly cast that differently, but if you look at any reasonable summary of the Gamergate kerfuffle, that's what it would be. Um, there's a really tightly connected group of a lot of people who uh, are part of the Gamergate mo movement. You can see them talking about video games using the Gamergate hashtag. Um, who are actively harassing people. We have a purple group underneath that who are Trump supporters. Uh, this is certainly not all Trump supporters online, but there's uh, a kind of dedicated group of accounts that were blocked here, and the core of their activities were about support for Donald Trump. Um, sort of related to that, but geographically different, we have UK-based Brexit and anti-Muslim supporters in the orange down at the bottom. Um, and they were they tended to be doing more targeting in the UK. This was, it's interesting because we looked at this in uh, 2017, so sort of a year after a lot of the uh, Brexit kind of debate was happening. And at first we couldn't figure out what that group was. We could tell they were in the UK, but they were mostly tweeting about soccer. And we had to go back in their tweets to suddenly then find the really harassing, violent, uh, racist stuff around the Brexit debate, um, particularly against Muslims. If we look at the middle, we have this sort of yellowish cluster. Um, this is the alt-right. That includes neo-Nazis and also really far right-wing groups in the U.S. And then one other cluster that was really interesting to us is this gray one over here. We looked at that, and these were clearly anime fans. They were all posting lots of anime, and we couldn't figure out why an anime group would be grouped in with all of these other groups where you can clearly see how they would be harassing people. And what we found out after we published the paper, we didn't find a reason, we just knew what they were doing, is that there's a really strong and weird uh, anime alt-right movement that uses anime um, to support alt-right causes. Uh, there's a great article on this that BuzzFeed did really delving deep into this group, which we had no idea about. Um, it was actually somebody else on Twitter who was able to explain it to me and link us to the article. And so it's one of those things where like you can define a pattern, but you can't necessarily explain it um, without doing a much, much deeper dive into the context. And fortunately, someone was able to give us that. So I think this is interesting because it shows that there really is a network of people, that people who enjoy doing harassment online are connected to other people who enjoy doing harassment online. Um, and that that harassment sort of becomes part of the cultural activities that they're partaking in. And that leads me into another study, which is not one we did, but one of my favorites, um, looking at why do people harass and troll online. So this is from a paper called Trolls Just Want to Have Fun. Uh, it's a great paper, one of my favorite ones out there. And what they did was ask people what they enjoy doing online. And uh, so I've kind of shortened the description of that, but basically people who don't like to comment on anything online is our first group. If we're looking at the x-axis here, uh, people who enjoy debating issues, chatting, trolling is its own category, and then other, which obviously includes anything else. And then they had everyone take a series of personality tests called the dark tetrad. So these are personality tests that are designed to capture kind of anti-social destructive behavior. Uh, Machiavellianism is basically your belief that the ends justify the means regardless of what the means are. Uh, narcissism is a belief that you're better than everyone else. Psychopathy uh, really deals with a lack of empathy for others. Uh, direct sadism and vicarious sada sadism are two parts of, obviously, sadism, uh, which is enjoyment of inflicting pain on others. And so this really was looking at 
um, trolling, not just as, oh, you know, I'm making fun of someone or trying to get a rise out of them, but uh, I'm really, really trying to upset people. Uh, I'm kind of trying to destroy communities. I want to make bad things happen. And so what we can see is that our x-axis here goes across zero. That's people who are sort of in a neutral position. Uh, so non-commenters tend to be a little bit below neutral. So kind of non-Machiavellian, non-narcissist, non-psychopath, non-sadists. People who like to debate, they're a little bit up there. Um, people who like to chat pretty much in the neutral spot here. People who do other stuff, um, a little bit more strongly on the negative side. And then I've blocked out the trolls because uh, we just need to look at that separately. And so if we look at the trolls, here are their scores super high in all of these traits. And so what this tells us is that people who enjoy trolling tend to score very high on this dark tetrad of personality characteristics that essentially say they think they're better than everyone, they like to watch people suffer, and uh, they'll do whatever they have to do to get there. And so coming from that perspective, it's interesting to think about trolling as an activity that's not just, oh, I believe in this political position and I'm arguing for it, but it's something that people do because they really enjoy seeing the negative consequences of their actions. So do I have anything good to tell you? Um, yeah, there's a really interesting study. Um, this is, again, not one that we did, but it was looking at, are there ways that we can stop people from doing this? And so the researcher here created a series of bots. They would look for people who are using racial slurs, like the example that we have here up at the top. And then the bot would auto respond with this message. Hey man, just remember that there are real people who are hurt when you harass them with that kind of language. The bot would always say the same thing. Uh, and he tested different conditions. So he looked at what does the character look like here? He would change the name of the character. Um, so this one is a traditional like non-white European descended name, basically. Um, and then he also had more kind of Anglo-Saxon names like Mark Johnson. Um, and then he also would change the character where it would be uh, a white guy or a darker skinned guy. And what he found in this study is that uh, if you got a message like this, most of the time, following that message didn't change anything that you did. Uh, you kept using the offensive language, you kept harassing people. But if the message came from a white guy with a traditional kind of Anglo-Saxon white European sounding name, uh, it actually decreased the harassment that people were treating going forward. So it was an intervention that worked, at least in the short term, that after someone said that, you reduced your use of racial slurs and harassment like that. And so it's interesting that it has to come from someone who's in the quote-unquote privileged group that a harasser like that might respect. Uh, if it comes from someone with darker skin, if it comes from someone with a name that feels foreign to those people, um, then they don't really respond to it. But if it comes from a white guy with a name that they feel familiar with, um, they actually will decrease it. And so, you know, that's not all like happy and light. It's, it's too bad that like there's a specific group that responds. But it does tell us that there are ways of doing intervention, both automatically with bots like this and by saying, hey, white guys with name people are going to recognize you need to step up and be the ones to intervene because it actually does have an impact. Investment research, um, a lot of people trying to tackle the problem from all sorts of technical and sociological perspectives. We're not going to be able to stop people from doing bad things, but there are ways that we're looking at to try to detect, identify, and intervene to improve everyone's experiences online.